Up next, we have uh, Dr. Paul Wise. So Dr. Wise is a professor in pediatrics and senior fellow at, Freeman, at the Freeman Spogli Institute. And today, he's discussing confronting women's health in areas of conflict and political instability. Well, thank you very much for the privilege of participating uh, in this program. We can't really talk about women's health and well-being in areas of political instability without beginning recognizing what's going on in northern Nigeria, the Boko Haram uh, kidnappings, and the outrage that it has generated throughout the world um, in ways that many other violations of human rights of women in areas of political instability have not generated. But while we must recognize the importance of this experience and recognize the outrage that the whole world feels at what's happening, we also recognize that this experience, this episode, may not, in fact, be directly representative of the threat to women's health and well-being that's going on all the time in areas of political instability and poor governance and conflict. That we may need to dig a little deeper, not forgetting this experience, of course, but dig a little deeper to really understand the profound nature of the threat to women's health and well-being in areas of conflict. Now, we need to talk a little bit about how we, as a global society, have addressed the impact of war and conflict on civilians, including women. And in general, the way that the world has approached this has been to focus on three arenas of conflict, pre-war, what in fact are good reasons, acceptable reasons to go to war, how to actually go to war, how to protect civilians in areas of combat during war, and then in the post-war reconstruction, basically giving, giving up responsibility for the reconstruction uh, of societies post-conflict. And this is generally the way we have approached civilian needs, civilian health, women's health in areas of conflict and political instability. Now, this is primarily related to what's generally called direct effects. This is primarily mortality due to combat, getting caught in crossfire, injury associated with the violence of war, and also to a certain extent, particularly the vul special vulnerabilities of women, of sexual violence in areas of active combat, militias coming through, and such. Now, the strategies to address these direct effects, have, one has been basically called just war theory, pre-war, war, reconstruction, post-war, that in fact there are just ways of doing pre-war, war, and reconstruction. In addition, over the last 100 years or so, have been the development of international conventions to insist that combatants conform to certain rules of war. The Geneva Conventions um, is one example. And then third, most recently, have been international criminal proceedings uh, where perpetrators of violations of, in fact, just war theory certainly of wide-scale sexual violence against women, will be brought to justice in international uh, criminal courts or other legal proceedings. And in general, this has been our approach. Now, my suggestion is that we look more carefully, we're going to see how inadequate these approaches have been. That basically, the direct effects are combat exposure, and combatant sexual violence. These are important. And of course, we must address these issues. And one of the pr 
primary ways has been just security and protection. Moving in with peacekeeping forces, other kinds of military forces to create safe havens for people who are vulnerable to active conflict. And we have UNHCR, the UN um, refugee organization that develops refugee camps like this one here throughout the world um, that are in many ways directed at the direct effects to provide direct physical protection and security and to provide some type of adequate living arrangement for um, people who have been displaced by direct combat. But there are also indirect effects. And these indirect effects are related to issues of displacement that whole communities, societies are uprooted in ways that far surpass what refugee camps would imply. That far more refugees are living in the bush or trying to find refuge in other areas than are actually winding up in UNHCR camps. That these indirect effects that are not directly related to exposure to violence but because of displacement and, as you see, other indirect effects can be profound. And when you look at the world, generally how we tend to think of it, it's a map of the world, of where refugees are coming from and where they're going, you get a very different kind of map. The top is where refugees in the world are coming from, and the bottom is where they go. And what you can see is the huge impact of ongoing political instability and civil conflict in certain parts of the world, but also where people go, where the refugees are going are usually in neighboring areas. They're not coming to the San Francisco area for the most part. They're not coming to the United States. They're not going to Europe. That these indirect effects are dramatic. And you get displacement and the whole infrastructure of health service provision can collapse when you have considerable political instability and conflict. Things like immunizations, things like antibiotics, at times contraception, whatever infrastructure existed prior to conflict is gone. That there's almost a complete collapse of the health infrastructure. You also have the most profound of all, which is the erosion and the collapse of the social fabric of community life. That the norms and relationships in communities are completely broken down because of ongoing chronic political instability and civil conflict. And you see this when it comes to sexual violence, when it comes to rapes, when it comes to other kinds of violence directed especially to women. That what you see is profound uh, violence associated with the breakdown of community norms and community relationships. Because what is important to re remember in the areas where we are in the world is aware of sexual violence against women in areas of conflict and political instability is that the majority of rapes that take place are not perpetrated by unknown militia combatants. They are, in fact, perpetrated by people the women knew, people from their own communities, maybe even a family member. That the risk of sexual violence in areas of political instability and conflict are greatest because of the breakdown in the social fabric of community life, not the perpetration of militias coming through, although that, of course, is a central concern. We need to recognize it's the collapse of traditional relationships and community life that generates the greatest concern. We also see this in morbidity and mortality. This is Darfur, at the height of the fighting in Western Sudan in the Darfur area. These are causes of mortality, which reflects women's mortality, including maternal mortality, and that it was, of course, mortality associated with exposure to direct combat. But the vast majority of the mortality 
the injuries and the sexual violence that took place in, in Darfur, the height of the fighting okay, was not associated with direct exposure to combat. It was due to the co collapse of the health infrastructure, displacement, food supplies were reduced, and the social fabric of community life that was always inherently protective of the most vulnerable in those societies basically had evaporated. That the indirect effects, not directly related to exposure, is by far the greatest challenge to women's health and well-being in areas of conflict and political instability. So when we think of the pre-war, war, post-war, war, just war theory, when you look more closely at what's really going on, is that you recognize that, in fact, there is no pre-war, war, post-war in most of these areas. It's a churning instability that post-war is actually pre-war. You just have to wait a couple of years for another explosion of violence to take place. That the just war theory that legal scholars, that our conventions are basically set up to address, completely fall apart, are desperately inadequate in addressing the real challenges in areas of political instability and conflict in the world. Now, when we think about our response, the Western world, to the health needs of women, the health needs of these communities in these areas, I'm going to show you this slide. This is Sub-Saharan Africa, and this is a plot of Development Assistance for Health, DAH. It's basically overseas funding for health programs per need. Disability adjusted life here is a measure of need in those societies. Okay. And I just want to call your attention to the light greens and the light blues. And this is where there's very little assistance given the need. You get some dark reds, or one red here, um, particularly Namibia, because there just aren't many people living in Namibia, and you get sort of an artifact of, of this ratio. But let me call your attention to the DRC, light green. Sudan, light green. Nigeria, light green. Central African Republic, light blue. Zimbabwe has turned from purple to light blue. Okay. That the areas receiving the least amount of development assistance for health per need are precisely the areas we're most concerned about. If you plot this by women's mortality rate by development assistance, per, uh, of development assistance for health per capita, you get this inverse relationship. You get Namibia, Botswana, Zambia, Rwanda, Malawi, Ghana up on the left, and who do you have down in the right bottom corner? Okay, basically, you have Angola, Sierra Leone, Chad, DRC, Nigeria. I think you get the picture. That the places with the highest maternal mortality, precisely the places least likely to get funding from our big government agencies, multilateral agencies, NGOs, which focus their attentions, attention on places like Malawi, Zambia, Rwanda. Okay. That, in fact, the areas of light blue and light green are precisely the areas of greatest political instability and poor governance. Now, it's understandable why big funders don't really like to spend and go to places that are politically unstable and poorly governed. I get it. It's understandable. But it's no longer acceptable. We need better strategies that can actually function in these kinds of arenas. Now, people talk about it, well, these are the basket cases. I was at a meeting yesterday where they talked about the basket cases, as if they're somehow anomalous peripheral concerns. The majority of preventable maternal and child deaths in sub-Saharan Africa, almost 60%, are occurring precisely in the areas of light blue and light green, of areas of political instability and chronic civil strife. You are not going to be able to address maternal and child health to any significant extent in sub-Saharan Africa unless we focus on the areas of poor governance and ongoing chronic strife. There's no way around it. 
Now, we at Stanford in the Bay Area have embarked on a series of initiatives to try to come up with new strategies to address these issues, to find, basically finding it unacceptable the status quo of how the world is addressing health, particularly maternal health and women's health in these areas. Now, we have this collaboration between Stanford Center for Innovation and Global Health, which uh, Michelle directs, um, and also the Freeman Spogli Institute here for International Studies, and UCSF's Global Health Institute to improve health in areas of political instability. And the way we have to do it is through new integrated technical health and political strategies, getting the political scientists together with the public health people, with the medical people, with the women's health people, with the anthropologists who work in areas of civil strife and political instability. Okay. To create new cross-disciplinary relationships and strategies that can actually function in these areas. Now, there are many elements to our approach to these issues, but I want to build upon what Michelle has talked about and Ruth before me in pointing out one, and that is we are very good at documenting the vulnerability of women in these settings. We have tried to address the vulnerabilities of women in areas of political instability and civil strife. What we have not done is recognized nor respected the strength that women have in these areas. That there are enormous missed opportunities to build upon the strength of women functioning in areas of civil conflict, in refugee camps, in addressing the indirect effects that may never make it into any kind of legal setting in Geneva, The Hague, or Arusha. That in fact, women are the pillars of strength in these communities, and that doesn't go away when they become displaced. It doesn't go away when there's poor governance, corrupt governance all around them. That this is a missed opportunity that we can begin to address in our work. Now, I'm going to show you one example of how we're trying to build upon the strengths while recognizing and attending to the vulnerabilities, the special vulnerabilities of women in these areas. And that's a set of activities in Guatemala. Guatemala, Central America, um, absolutely beautiful country, um, but also deeply troubled, ravaged by 40 years of civil war, particularly in the poorest areas of Guatemala, in the indigenous areas of Guatemala. Um, and the peace accords were signed in the late 90s, but still Guatemala is racked by less political violence, but profound criminal and social violence, and indeed directed against women. This is an area close to our border that has been characterized, plagued by profound instability, poor governance, and civil strife. How do you begin to build on the strength of particularly an indigenous community of women to create health infrastructure when there, in fact, is not really much of a government or governance uh, infrastructure. In fact, in some of these areas, governance remains predatory. How do you build a health system in these areas? Well, basically, the effort has focused on the development of community health worker systems, <clears throat> primarily, not exclusively, women, but women are clearly the strength of these programs. And women go through, in these programs, uh, three years of training as community volunteers nominated by their communities uh, in indigenous areas of Highland Guatemala. And they will learn both preventive and therapeutic skills. Here, this is a nutrition surveillance program where they weigh all the kids in their areas. Um, but what has to be recognized is that this is not just a community health worker program to deal with health. These women are community organizers. And we have political scientists and 
anthropologists working with us from Stanford, increasingly from UCSF, from uh, programs within Central America to try to create integrated systems of care that have the power to really affect change and improve health, particularly women's health in these areas, around contraception, around reducing domestic and sexual violence in these areas. And in fact, the women are developing strategies that can, in fact, will be um, disseminated uh, in other parts of Central America and throughout the world. But there's also something else that's going on that's important to recognize that builds on women's strengths. And it has to do with the development of new technologies that will in fact facilitate women's insights being brought to bear on these issues, but also women's capabilities. And we have students here uh, professors in computer science is developing um, mobile systems. And there are all kinds of cell phone and mobile systems for health all around the world. It's, it's pretty common these days. But what this is really focused on is providing enhanced decision support to the women community health workers to provide far more expert and capable health services that you could ever train in the very short period of time that will likely be available. To use new emerging technologies to enhance their capabilities here to predict which kids are going to run into trouble with nutrition. Running predictive models on servers both in Guatemala and here in real time to give these women far greater capability. When you take a step back and look at what this really is, yeah, it's a technical little app that's going to sit on some tablets. Fine. But what it's really trying to do is to evade political and governance blockades to the improvement of health in these areas. It is a political technology as much as a health technology. When you think about why cell phones have taken off in much of the developing world, it was because it was a technology that evaded long-standing governance blockade. It still takes seven years to get a landline put in in Costa Rica. I know, because I've tried it. Okay. Now, you just go down the street, 10 minutes, you have your own cell phone. The reason why cell phones took off is because it evaded a governance blockade to this powerful communication. Okay. We're looking for technical ways to build on political strengths of these communities to evade predatory governance, corruption, and political strife. How are we doing it? Well, I mentioned that these are all important areas, but one is to strengthen the protective security. We need to do better with peacekeepers and protective security. And we have military people, uh, very experienced military people here at Stanford helping us to think this through. The second is to come up with new creative, integrated technical and political strategies. I've talked about that. We see this as essential, and we see a new generation of leaders coming out with capabilities of both arenas. And the last is to build on women's strengths, women's strengths and capacity. Women have special vulnerabilities. We still need to, of course, address these. But we shouldn't allow their special vulnerabilities to overwhelm the political discourse and our technical approaches to improving health and well-being in these areas. My suggestion is that we do have a role. And looking out at all the young people, particularly young women out in uh, the audience, is first and foremost, get out there. Go out, spend time in these communities, spend time with the women. Really begin to ground your experience and knowledge okay, in real experiences on the ground, listening, participating with women in these areas. We do have something to offer. Our voice is important. That we do have new transdisciplinary collaborations. I'm always reminded of an eye of stone image of a group of researchers carefully writing down the movements of a troupe of dancers, but from behind a plate glass window. They are wonderful in writing down every jump, every leap, every turn, 
but they never hear the music. It's important for you to get out there, hear the music, the fugue of interaction that swirls around women's vulnerabilities but women's strengths. And that will best ensure that the dual struggles, the struggle for women's health and the struggle for justice, will ultimately both be met. Thank you.